Stu Marek coming to you from Super Bowl 57 Radio Row in Phoenix as I am anchoring the coverage for the Horn 104.9 FM in Austin. Uh, and it's not that often when the radio life and my professional life come together. But in this instance, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Joining me at the broadcast location, I have known her... Oh, Lord, 15 years at least. Easily. Uh, she, is, she has been so active, uh, you know, and now the, na- the president of the National, Asso- National Athletic Trainers Association, Kathy Derringer. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Stuart. How are you? It is good to see you. It's great to be here. Um, it's so funny. You know, like I said, you know, I've been, and I'm, you know, been doing athletic trainer licensing through... Department of State Health Services, and now with Department of Licensing Regulation, you know, 15, almost, yeah, a little over 15 years now, mm-hmm. and and we we see each other every year at like SWATA and and all these things, but this, I mean, when you came up to me this morning, it's like, hold it, what are you doing here? <laughs> it was so funny. Um, let me let's talk for a second. Uh, you know, the the spotlight has been on athletic trainers as of recent. Mm-hmm. Uh, just talk for a second about the awareness that, uh, you know, everything that happened with DeMar Hamlin, you know, everything that happened there has shown the spotlight on how vital athletic trainers are, uh, you know, in, in you know, health care. Mm-hmm. Not just professional sports, but all of health care. Yeah. Talk for a second about that. Yeah, I- I always hate to see something happen like what happened. Um, To have an athlete suffer a cardiac arrest in ever Mm -hmm. is is one of our worst nightmares as as athletic trainers. What we saw that night in front of the world stage um, was athletic trainers who had created their emergency action plan, Mm -hmm. had rehearsed their emergency action plan, and who executed it with precision to make sure that DeMar Hamlin got the fastest and the most efficient care that he could have gotten. And yes, it has brought a a new attention to athletic trainers across the country. And, and I love to see that. I hate that it took that, but I love to see that now people are saying, yeah, athletic trainers are, are pretty critical, but it also makes me recognize that what about the high school down the road? We know, and, and in Texas we're fairly lucky, a good portion of our, of our schools have access to an athletic trainer. But across the country, one-third of high schools do not have access to an athletic trainer. So if that situation were to happen, or another emergency of another type, who's taking care of that child? Yeah. Who's protecting your child? Um, it, and and prioritizing their health and safety. You know, and, and and you're right. In Texas, you know, I I've been doing again the licensing stuff, but you know, I've been on the radio doing sideline reporting for high school football, and you know, I've gotten to know so many athletic trainers, and it's and it's you know fun to watch them, and and, and you know, it's one of those things where you're so glad they're out there. You just hope. They don't have to do anything, you know. I hope it's just, they're just standing on the sideline like the rest of us. Um, you met, you know, the the attention from the Demar Hamlin incident, and and thank God Demar is doing well. Mm-hmm. Looks like he's going to be. Has that spurned on any push? Because I know in recent years there has been the push to elevate like education. I know you know now. Like uh, accredited athletic trainer programs now have to be a master's level program, um, and it feels like there is you know it this is gonna help to elevate that even more. There are you know and the, and other issues. Just talk about how this will elevate the profession to a new level. I I think this incident has created an atmosphere that we already knew, the value of an athletic trainer uh, to prioritize the health and safety is tremendous. We we see it at the high school and the collegiate and the professional level. 
we also have athletic trainers who are working in other settings, mm -hmm. um, the industrial setting, the, the military setting, mm -hmm. performing arts, clinics, hospitals. There are so many other settings where we're there to help that patient participate in the activity that they love. And if there's an injury, uh, hopefully to prevent the injury, mm -hmm. but if there is an injury to help them get back to that activity as fast as possible. This event really highlighted that for us. And, but NA, NATA's job has always been to advocate for the athletic trainer, for a, yeah. to advocate for our members and to promote the profession um, in any way possible. Our, our status in healthcare is, is pretty clear. But what I'm seeing now is that people who maybe didn't know who we were or right. what we did are starting to realize how important we are. Well, and that's the thing, you know, I, you know, I know guy, you know, I knew, I know former NFL players that played back in the seventies and such. And at that time, you know, the, the joke was, oh, they're there to tape ankles and give you Gatorade. And you watch them. And even, even, you know, when I started with licensing, they were there, you knew the value, but again, it was kind of limited. And now it just seems like it keeps growing and growing and growing. Like you mentioned, they're now in other settings, military, uh, you know, uh, first, first, uh, uh, you know, public defender, uh, public defense, uh, that type of thing. Um, you know, I, tell me a couple, couple of the issues facing the profession as you go forward this year and even beyond. Yeah, I think the one, the first is we've already mentioned is how can we continue to advocate for the profession so those schools who have not made the decision to put an athletic trainer in their school system to take care of those athletes will see why it's important and will take that step. That's one of the most important. I think the other now is um, we're starting to see um, athletic trainers becoming more more selective about the jobs that they take and are, are they are prioritizing a work-life balance. So you're seeing athletic trainers choosing to go outside of those traditional settings to something that has regular hours and, and probably pays more. So how, how do we improve mm -hmm. um, the work culture that seems to have been prevalent in, in some of our settings? Um, and, and then salary is always, has always been a, a buzzword among our profession. Right. And, and how do we help athletic trainers um, advocate for themselves in terms of their compensation package so, so their salaries reflect the job that they're doing? Yeah. You know, one of the things that has blown me away, you know, because I'll go, uh, you know, the board certification, they always do this regulatory conference mm -hmm. every couple of years, and I go, uh, it's it's wonderful to get to meet other regulators from other states, and you know, of course, we take a little pride with Texas because we were the first. First license. We were the first license, 1971. We just celebrated 50th anniversary, and yet, the state of California has no regulation whatsoever. Right. And that blows me away. A state as the size of that state with with so much. You know, so many, you know, whether it's, you know, teams and, and ways to help, and yet they have no regulation whatsoever for athletic mm -hmm. training. And, you know, every other state, uh, I think Hawaii gained it, what, three, four years ago, mm -hmm. three, four or five years ago. You know, they now, I think they, I think they have certification or registration. Uh, but, you know, every other state regulates athletic trainers except California. What? In your mind, what is it going to take for California to finally recognize, okay, we need to put, you know, we need to incorporate state licensure? Yeah, we've been working on this for two decades, mm -hmm. and I can't explain why it's an issue. Um, why would a state think it's okay to have someone standing on a sideline working with athletes, calling themselves an athletic trainer, mm -hmm. And yet they've had no educational background and, and certainly can do that without being certified or licensed, which means that they are putting those athletes at risk. Mm -hmm. And parents, do they even know 
are they assuming because that person is calling themselves an athletic trainer that they have the expertise that that we have? Um, I wish I could explain yeah. what what the what the problem has been to get this through. We're fighting again right now to get to get licensure in California. I'm hoping that the incident with Demar um, brings a little more notoriety to California. That to say. Yeah, this is kind of scary that that we don't have regulation for athletic trainers in the state of California. Yeah. But we'll continue, as an association, we'll continue to fight side by side with the ATs in California until we can make that happen. Okay. Uh, you know, of course, you know, in Texas, again, been doing this for over 50 years. And, you know, I, you know, uh, you know when I'm at SWAT, I always bring the book, mm -hmm. that ledger, that piece of history that shows when you know licensing first happened you know in the days of alan eggert and and and, and uh and uh, uh frank medina and those and those gentlemen um what 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 do you see i mean i know you're the national president but you're very involved in texas athletic trainers what is is there is there a new challenge hurdle whatever to to overcome in texas Oh, that's a great question, and I, I haven't, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Quite honestly, Stu, I'm, and that's okay. It's um, I, I know that um, our longtime executive director, Spanky Stevens, mm -hmm. is about to retire. Okay. So um, making that transition, and what will a new leadership look like mm -hmm. um, in the TSATA? Um, I'm confident that the new president, Roy, um, will will be forward thinking and will um, do everything that he can to protect the licensed athletic trainer in the state of Texas. That board works really hard at what they do. Um, and I'm proud of everything that they're doing. And I can't wait to see what's accomplished over the next year. Absolutely. You know, uh, look, I've been, like I said, been doing this for over 15 years. I, it is, it is my fa It's one of my favorite things because uh, I, again, getting to getting to know all the athletic trainers and hearing the stories and and just you know and in in kind of helping them you know yes you know we are the licensing agency yes we are there to enforce the laws of the state of texas mm -hmm. so you know we have to remain impartial but yeah i mean i root for them because again uh being on a side being on the sideline for lake travis football i see i've seen them in action and uh, and you know the worth, and it has been, it's been one of my true, uh, you know, it's something I just love to do, and it's it's been it's been wonderful, and uh, you know, getting to know folks like you and David Weir and 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 uh, uh, and, and the rest of them, uh, where the advisory board of athletic trainers works so well with TSATA and SWATA and and NATA, and so uh, Kathy Derringer, the president of the National Athletic Trainer Association. Kathy, it's good to see you. Great to see you. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you for having me.